Eight years after the launch of GTA V, it is still one of the most popular titles in gaming. It still ranks high in the sales charts every month, and sometimes enters the top 10. GTA V is so popular that last year it went toe-to-toe -to -toe with God of War in IGN's Best Game of All Time poll, voted for by the players. The numbers are impressive, and there aren't many games that have become part of gaming culture like GTA V. But why then, after all of these years, why are we still playing a game that was first released in 2013? The answer to this is because GTA V has an exceptional open world, a map with three huge different areas and a massive sandbox that contains hours of fun. The world of GTA V is one to get lost in, where its best moments are created by the player rather than the game. That's not to say the game isn't great, because here we have some of the best missions in the series and a brand new character swap that fundamentally changes GTA for the better. But GTA V also has issues. At times, we are retreading a lot of old ground and we have a narrative which is obnoxious, shallow and makes less sense the more we think about it. So, with this in mind, I'll be reviewing GTA V in depth, discussing a ton of spoilers along the way and answering two key questions. Is GTA V worth replaying for the next gen upgrade? And more importantly, is GTA V still great? In many games, we play as different characters. In Mass Effect 2, we briefly play as Joker when Shepard is on a mission and the Normandy is attacked, and more recently in The Last of Us 2, we play as Abby for around 10 to 15 hours. So it's not unique to play as different characters in a game, and even Rockstar has used this technique before. But what sets GTA 5 apart from most other games is that we can swap between characters whenever we want and control them independently. Some games like State of Decay in 2013 use this mechanic, but usually we have a squad who follows us every time we switch. Out of all these games though, GTA 5 implements this system in the cleverest way. Rather than simply swapping to someone else, we see our characters living their life. Franklin is talking to his ex-girlfriend or simply cleaning his car, whereas Trevor is holding someone at gunpoint until they jump in the sea and show him their backstroke. Like the best parts of previous GTAs, Rockstar has used tiny details to elevate the simplest of tasks. What I really liked about this system was how it expands mission design in unprecedented ways. Because when we think about it, we can now be in three places at once. We can have a combat mission where we're on the front line with an assault rifle, but now we can also be up high with a sniper. Or we can have Trevor extracting information from a hostage while Michael runs around town using this information to track down our targets. The new heist showcased this feature perfectly, where we steal from different places throughout the game. At first, it starts off simple, as we rob a local jewellery store, but by the end of the game, we're robbing the largest bank in the world to steal four tons of gold. And like in GTA 4, we have to prepare for each mission manually. We have a plan and we have to gather each piece of the puzzle, the outfits, the vehicles and the weapons, or even scoping out our target to check how their security system works. Occasionally, these moments fall flat, as they are essentially glorified fetch quests, but they never become a problem and can be ticked off relatively easily. Building on the squad shooter mechanics, we have different options for each heist, including which crew members to use. It's not always an easy choice, as the more competent a crew member is, the larger the cut of the profits they take. But then if we select someone with lower stats, we'll earn more money, but then there's more risk of something going wrong. What's great about this mechanic is that our choices affect the mission in unique ways. If we select a cheaper crew, for example, we might have someone who crashes when we make our escape, and the money they're holding gets left behind. Or we might have a cheaper driver who chooses a bad vehicle and gets lost en route. It's a really clever way of implementing RPG choices into the game, as we see the consequences of our actions play out before us. On top of this, the most obvious difference is how we tackle the heist, with two unique objectives each time. These options are always incredibly creative and range from stealing a super weapon with a submarine or going undercover as a cleaner to plant bombs at the FIB headquarters. We also have to praise Rockstar for developing unique mechanics for each option, 
mini games where we hack into a security system or control traffic lights across the city are used once and never again. And we have completely bonkers mechanics that focus completely on fun, like blasting our way out of a bank with a minigun. Time to face the music! If I am being picky, I wish the crew mechanics had more depth, as this feels like the first iteration of a great idea. It would have been great if Rockstar gave each character more specific roles, like an actual RPG or tactical shooter. I mean, Trevor as an explosives expert is already a perfect fit. And although we are given two options for each heist, it would be good to have more freedom overall, like choosing where to place our crew before the heist starts to add a bit more strategy to each mission. We do see this in a late game mission, where we choose the best way to attack a sawmill, so it's clear that Rockstar were considering this mechanic, but unfortunately, it's only used in this mission. Outside of the heists, the main missions are also great. We have so many unique objectives, different scenarios, and missions with no combat whatsoever. There was a real risk of these missions falling flat, but I actually thought they were some of the best in the game. They all used tiny details to keep us immersed in the moment, whether it was an overlay in first person, a new mechanic, or great back and forth between our characters. My favourite part about the missions though, is something that is also new for the series, an in-game soundtrack developed specifically for GTA V. Seriously though, incredible work to everyone involved here, as these tracks perfectly capture the tone of each mission. When we have over-the-top action, like jumping onto a speeding train, the soundtrack is frantic and heavy on guitar, drums and bass. Whereas, when we're, say, sneaking into Michael's house with Franklin, the soundtrack is subdued with bongos and bass, just like we're watching a 70s cop show. He said I had a massive... Jimmy called me a bitch! He tried to knife attack me? And every track escalates throughout the mission, starting off quiet for a stealth section, then rising during a fist fight, finally finishing with triumphant synths as we fly across the city in a helicopter. Hey, Milton, why? I think you owe an apology to Mr. Richards. Would I be in pain? No, you should apologize to me. Unfortunately then, even though these missions are great, we are retreading a lot of old ground here, with missions that are very similar to San Andreas. Like driving onto a cargo plane, infiltrating a government lab, a shootout in a meat factory, a chase when someone hangs off a vehicle and we catch them, a mission at an industrial port, using thermal scopes, and more. GTA V definitely has the best version of these missions, but because we've already experienced them, they are never as impressive as the first time around. I should say that when GTA V released, this probably wasn't an issue, as there had been almost 10 years between both games. But it is interesting that when we play these games back to back, and as a result when the nostalgia is gone, they don't have the same impact. And using San Andreas type missions just doesn't work here, as GTA V has a different tone. In San Andreas, the presentation is cartoonish, and the entire game is like a blockbuster action film. So it's perfectly fine if we drive a car through a billboard, or skydive onto a moving plane, because this makes sense in the realms of the game. But GTA V isn't cartoonish, this world is presented as real. We have a lifelike presentation, realistic details in the open world, and characters that look like actual people. So when Trevor crashes two speeding trains together and dives 100 feet into the shallow water below, or when we use a digger to scoop up our crew as tanks shoot at us from all angles, it's not believable. Rockstar has gone too far, and we've entered the realm of stupidity. We see this at so many junctures in the narrative, where everything is too much. The narrative is not only convoluted, with wafer-thin plot points that make no sense, but all of the subtlety from GTA 4, with its outstanding character development and mature themes, has gone in favour of shock humour, cheap gags, shallow characters, and a plot which doesn't hold up. Let's just think about the plot for a minute. What actually happens in GTA 5? Well, we follow three characters whose paths cross in the year 2013. We have Michael, an ex-criminal who faked his death and went into witness protection. Trevor, Michael's old criminal buddy who thinks Michael is dead after their last job nine years ago. And Franklin, 
a local to Los Santos who grew up in the hood, similar to CJ in San Andreas. Michael is the main character here, and to be fair, he is the most developed. He's a middle-aged, retired man whose life hasn't turned out the way he'd hoped. He has fast cars, a big house, and other materialistic things we value in society. Yet, he is unhappy and can't connect with his family. His daughter is hanging around with the wrong people, and his wife is cheating on him with her tennis coach. This is really where our narrative starts, as Michael and Franklin join forces to get revenge on the tennis coach. So, we go over to his house, beat him up, and say if he comes around Michael's house again, we'll kill him. Except, this isn't what happens. What actually happens is Michael and Franklin use a truck to pull down the foundations of a house. This event then forces Michael back into a life of crime as the house is owned by local gangster Madrazo and we have to pay for the damages. Even though I'm not 100% sure it is physically possible to pull down the foundations of a house with a truck, this event alone would have been enough. We spend the game trying to repay our debts to Madrazo, which pushes us into the heists. Money is also a motive for each character, as GTA 5 is set in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So, all of this is fine. But then, the further we go, the more the narrative loses its way. Once Trevor and Michael are reunited, we work with the FIB because Michael broke his deal with them by returning to a life of crime. And then we work with a rich billionaire for no reason other than money. And somewhere along the way, Michael becomes a movie producer, literally out of nowhere. You really have to be along for the ride, because if you're not, it's easy to get frustrated with the narrative. It always feels like we're going backwards, just as the plot gets interesting. We repay our debt to Madrazo, only to work with him later in the game, take his wife hostage, and go back to square one. Then when we spend a couple of hours stealing a government super weapon, afterwards we immediately give it back. And finally, when we chase down the analog copy of Michael's film, we're told straight afterwards that there was a digital copy all along. Because there's no overarching theme to bring the narrative together, everything we do is pointless. So you mean to tell me this shit was all for nothing? This issue is compounded because of the writing, which at its best is uninteresting and at its worst is obnoxious. There are throwaway gags during key moments that alleviate any tension, shock humour which doesn't land, and dialogue which is too on the nose. Rather than the humour being a parody of modern life, like in other GTAs, the joke is always spelled out to us. And so many times, characters spout exposition, or literally say how they're feeling out loud, or blatantly describe the themes of the game. God, I'm not gonna be fucking gonna bleed out. I always thought I was the good guy. Just a fat, washed up jock who can't get his head around the fact that his high school football career didn't play out the way that he planned. You weren't even fucking dead. You were my best friend. I'm like a vulture just circling the desert looking for fucking corpses, you know? I'm an independent thinker. Living out here, away from the man. Well, am I detecting some, uh, some sort of, uh, son I never had bullshit here, Mikey, huh? Yeah, I was quite a trophy. A good head to hang on your wall. Right before I met you, I was boosting rise and racing. It feels like it come full circle to me. You know, while I was researching this review, I saw a line in an interview with Dan Hauser in The Guardian from 2012, who said this when discussing characters in Rockstar Games. For us, it starts with the characters. The story is always driven by the characters. It's always got to feel like someone you want to be propelled through the game world with. I don't want to be propelled through the game world with any of these characters. They are not likeable people. Michael talks to his family like shit, while Trevor emotionally abuses multiple people throughout the game. He randomly punches people in the street, which is just too much. Franklin is slightly better, as he's a bit more chilled. He's here to be the voice of reason, and basically rein Michael and Trevor in. But this just means his character is really bland. Having two anger-centric characters also means that cutscenes turn into shouting matches, where there's lines upon lines of dialogue, but nothing interesting is said. It's honestly exhausting. First you take a hostage against my advice and then you start some kind of crazy high school romance with her? Are you nuts? She's, she's a 60 year old housewife. I'm not saying the voice actors did a bad job because they didn't. Stephen Ogg in particular as Trevor was incredible and completely sold his character. It's just the writing. And I know we shouldn't expect every game to have Oscar worthy writing. In fact, I'd say we are generally behind film and TV in terms of storytelling. But GTA 5 was written by the same people as GTA 4, a mature game that said something profound about the modern world that is still relevant today.
Okay, so there have been improvements since GTA 4, and the narrative might not be a big deal to you. You might care more about side content and enjoying the open world. Well, I think if that's what you want from GTA 5, you'd think it was the best game in the series. Quite frankly, there is so much to do in GTA 5 that you could spend well over 100 hours here, maybe even 200 hours if you were taking your time. There's everything from races, to parachuting, to buying shares on the stock market. We can even play tennis and golf, which has everything you want from a standalone sports game. So many modern sandbox games reuse core mechanics to build their side content, but Rockstar has designed all of this from the ground up. I have so many memories from the side content that made GTA 5 for me. Cycling along a coastal road, heading to the top of a mountain to do yoga, or going scuba diving, searching for submarine parts. I mean, look at this. There are full-on shipwrecks down here, including a sunken cargo ship which we can explore freely, and this massive passenger aircraft. Like, what the hell? I spent two hours exploring down here for no reason. You don't even get any reward for finding these parts. But because the underwater setting was so cool, that was the reward in itself. GTA 5 also adds more content on top of this in the form of strangers and freaks and random events. The strangers and freaks are similar to the friends in GTA 4, will be complete missions for eccentric people. I always found their gameplay more engaging this time, as the objectives are better developed. We don't just go somewhere and tick off an objective, like fighting drug dealers or beating up someone. They're not always perfect, as a couple of missions overstay their welcome, but I always prefer having more variety to break up the pace of the main missions. The random events, though, are GTA 5's best new feature. By taking this mechanic from Rockstar's work on Red Dead Redemption, random events appear on our minimap when we pass a certain area. They give the impression that the world is organic, as they seemingly appear at random, but they are in fact scripted. I saw this same event trigger three times in one place, as well as one event twice in another. They do, however, make exploring constantly exciting, as we never know what's around the next corner. One time, for example, I entered a suburban at night, only to walk in on a robbery which caught me completely by surprise. Because the random encounters are hidden everywhere, it encourages us to explore this world. Sure, we can fast travel using in-game taxis or the character swap, but if we were to do that, we'd miss out on the best parts of the game. I saw this in one absolutely outstanding moment in the late game. Here, we pass a crashed car on the freeway and rescue this person from the wreckage. As we take them for medical attention in Sandy Shores, we learn she is a criminal and recruit her as a driver to use in the heists. And again, we see the Rockstar magic shining through here as she has unique dialogue in the missions. All of this happened by chance, just as I crossed by. It could easily have been missed, but Rockstar took the time to add in the smallest of details. Admittedly, a lot of the side content makes a return from previous GTAs, which does lessen its impact slightly. And unfortunately, because of the driving, activities involving vehicles aren't great. I know this is a controversial topic in the series, where the battle between GTA 4 and 5 to take the best driving crown rages on, but in my opinion, this system is a massive downgrade from GTA 4. If we compare both games, the driving in GTA 5 is more floaty, where all of the realistic weight from GTA 4 is gone. The motorbikes in particular don't feel right. I always found the races with bikes and off-road vehicles lack tension as we can turn easily at high speeds. The cars are slightly better, but even so, we no longer have to slow down gradually and get our car under control. There's little things too, like the absence of realistic crumple zones. Now when we smash into someone at high speeds, we only get a slight bump or some chipped paintwork. Of course, not every sandbox game has this either, but I would say the best open worlds use realistic touches like this. Elsewhere, there are other changes that are much better. The way we move our character is more fluid now, where climbing ladders and moving through tight spaces is less frustrating. We have more control overall and spend less time wrestling with the controls. We see this in combat too, which now has a new run and gun ability. This is designed to get us into the action quicker as we hold down the right trigger or R2 and easily push forwards. The combat system in general is more action orientated this time around, where Rockstar has used a lot of their learnings from Max Payne 3. For example, as well as the new run and gun, each character has a special ability. Michael can slow down time, which is most similar to Max Payne, whereas Trevor has a berserker mode. At first I didn't like these abilities, as they make combat too easy, but after a while I saw these abilities in a new way, as it is optional whether we use them or not. They basically act as difficulty sliders in the same way Vats does in Fallout. 
I always use VATS as it's a cool feature, but my mate prefers aiming manually to make the game harder and more realistic. Some things aren't optional though, as we now have modern touches like checkpoints and recharging health. It's an odd choice, as it removes a core part of the combat from GTA 4, where we had to play carefully due to our finite health. There's basically less thought overall, as enemies move through the battlefield more often. They always present themselves as targets, either standing out in the open or as they move across an arena. But I should point out, this is intentional, as GTA 5 is trying to be more action orientated. We see this in other games too, like Destiny and Doom, who also have enemies out in the open, and in Gears of War, where enemies reposition to give us a chance to shoot them. So it isn't necessarily a case of dumb AI. I'd actually say the AI was still intelligent, with enemies that push forward to put us on the back foot, and also shoot us when they're down but not out. Is the combat system as good as GTA 4? No, it's not, because we've lost a lot of the realism which made it feel like anything could happen. And I would say that enemies die a little too easily, sometimes when we shoot them in the legs, which makes no sense. But these minor issues never become a problem. As we have more varied missions, it means we spend less time in combat compared to GTA 4. Of course, it would be great to have more depth, but that doesn't take away from what we have here. Right, so we're coming to the end of this review, and there's one massive point we've not discussed. Something that is grand in scale, yet full of detail, and something that secures Rockstar as industry leaders of open world design. GTA 5 is one of the most impressive open worlds in gaming. Los Santos and the surrounding areas are huge. So large, in fact, that the map in GTA 5 is almost twice as large as the massive map from San Andreas. We've returned to LA this time around, as Rockstar felt they didn't do it justice in San Andreas. The map of San Andreas was impressive, but actual Los Santos was relatively small. So in GTA 5, rather than having three smaller cities, we have one large city and two rural areas, forming the deserts and the countryside. Los Santos is as close to a real city as any game can be, and Rockstar have perfectly captured Hollywood in 2013. We see the massive mansions and gated houses in the Vinewood Hills, the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and famous establishments in the inner city, including a handful of movie theatres. It also serves as a great tourist destination, with beaches by the seafront and a fun fair on the pier. The beaches are seriously impressive, with people swimming in the sea, lifeguards on duty, and items you'd expect to see at any beach. It's a massive step up compared to Vice City and San Andreas, with beaches that were barren and lifeless. Outside of Los Santos, we have the deserts around Sandy Shores and the countryside of Blaine County. These areas provide much needed visual variety, but they've also been redesigned to something special. I mean, look at the density of the vegetation for example. It's out of this world, with different species of plants scattered everywhere, including Joshua trees to give us that Californian desert feel. It's not quite on the same level as modern games, but it's incredible for 2014 on the PS4 and the Xbox One. The best part about these areas is that they are not just video game biomes. Each area was designed with world building in mind, as each has lifelike communities within them. Palito Bay in Blaine County, for example, is a small rural town, with bars, a fire station and a local church. And on the outskirts of town, we see farms, factories and sawmills that show us how this community lives, a bit like we see farms in Skyrim and The Witcher 3. Exploring this world was always a joy because of details like this. The scale is already incredible, with huge mountains all around us, but there is so much to see hidden on the ground. And this really is an open world, where we can go anywhere we want. I spent hours cycling along mountain paths, or going for walks in the hills just because I could. We can even go miles out to sea if we want to, and like I said in my GTA 3 review, modern games would have text on screen telling us to go back, or a kill timer. But that never happens here. Instead, a shark attacks us and sends us back to the hospital. It's a genius way of including a kill timer, yet making it make sense in this world. Please other developers, use techniques like this and let's get rid of the text and kill timers. So, this all sounds incredible, right? Well, things get even better as there are hundreds of tiny details hidden away just waiting to be discovered. The way NPCs go about their lives, going on bike rides in the countryside or taking their dogs out for walks. The fact we now have animals makes this world feel alive, with loads of wildlife scattered across the map, including actual killer whales in the sea. Yeah. 
NPCs also walk differently to each other, like this guy here, who we can tell is clearly upset about something. People sit on the grass in parks or at university campuses, and people are working out at the athletics track nearby. If we trespass on someone's property, they'll turn hostile and attack, but if we get out a weapon, they'll get scared and run off. When we enter water, our clothes get wet, and this is only up to the point where our clothes are submerged, as you can see here when I popped in this fountain. Cars have unique interiors, with different speed dials depending on the model. We can see here that this retro car has a retro speed dial, which was a nice touch. We can also see a headlight sign turn on on the dashboard, which changes when we switch to full beam. And when we're in a car, the Blaine County radio station is only available when we're in Blaine County. It even cuts out if we drive out of the area, as we lose the signal. Thank you, that's another part of our admission. And I mean, the detail in the interior spaces was in a class of its own, with individual items on shelves, worktops and in shops. To be fair, other games have this level of detail, but the difference in GTA V is consistency, where I never saw copy and pasting like we have in other games. The only game that comes close to GTA V is Watch Dogs 2, where Ubisoft does a handful of things better than Rockstar. But Watch Dogs 2 came out three years after GTA V, where most of the groundwork was already laid. I guess the biggest issue here is that while all of this is great, it is still a step back from the open world in GTA 4. But it's my understanding that game development is about compromise. If you want a large open world, you have to sacrifice detail. And likewise, if you want solid core gameplay mechanics, you have to sacrifice gameplay variety. And this is based on a number of things, like budget, development time, and the number of people working on a game. I do think what we have in GTA 5 is good enough, as I don't think we should take something like Red Dead Redemption 2 and make that the norm. I mean, the amount of time it would take to pad out this world on the same level as GTA 4 would be insane. But I do wish some features were carried over, like the way cops arrest people for example, by chasing them down and putting them in the back of a cop car. Now that doesn't happen, as cops just shoot people in the street, which is a step back to the San Andreas system from 2004. It's odd because this code is in the game. There's a random event when a cop arrests someone in the style of GTA 4, but it's only in this random event from what I've seen. And other things too, like items that break realistically. We still have a lot of items that break in the open world, but rather than break realistically, the item seemingly explodes with a predetermined effect, which is what most other games do. And arguably, going inside more buildings would have helped pad out the world, like going inside fast food restaurants or apartments, and how their interiors were different in different parts of the world. But still, GTA V is an exceptional open world that was completely ahead of its time on release. So, here we are at the end of the GTA Still Great series, with the next-gen version of GTA V rapidly approaching. I find myself in a strange place, because after playing all of the mainline GTA games back to back, I have never loved and hated a game like I do with GTA V. On one hand, it has an incredible open world, full of interesting things to do and see, but on the other, it has a narrative which is so obnoxious I wanted to stop playing. But we still have to appreciate how groundbreaking this was on release, to have a world of this size that still has an impressive amount of detail, and the new heist and character swap mechanics and how they benefit gameplay in unprecedented ways. So with this in mind, is GTA V still great? The answer to this is yes, GTA V is still great. However, that doesn't mean I think you should replay it for the next gen version. I don't think the narrative is worth pushing through just to play the heists, and a lot of the content is similar to San Andreas. If you've played the Definitive Editions recently, that GTA itch may have already been scratched. And finally, as I look back over making these reviews, I've started to appreciate Rockstar as some of the best developers in our industry. They not only laid the foundations for modern open worlds with GTA 3 in 2001, but they continually improved the formula with each new game. They constantly pushed the boundaries of what games could be. Thank you to everyone at Rockstar for making these games. And can we have GTA 6 now? Hmm.